Back in 1999, I used to work as a park ranger over at Yosemite National Park. It wasn't a job I ever really saw myself doing. The fact was that until I busted my knee and had to stop playing football, the NFL was seriously all I ever dreamed of. I was obsessed. It was football in the morning, football in the afternoon, and at night I used to dream about it. But like many young men's dreams, they turned out to be nothing but the stuff of pipes. I needed a job, I needed money, and I needed it fast. So when an uncle told me of an opening up at Yosemite for a park ranger, I jumped at the chance. He told me it was relatively easy work, mostly outdoors, and I could rely on it. As long as there was state funding, as long as there were still trees sprouting out of the ground, I'd always have work. And so there I was, 23 years old, decked out in my park ranger's uniform, hiking through valleys and over hills, popping ibuprofen whenever my knees started to play up. I'd done the job for about two years in March of 99, and honestly, I'd grown to love it. Being out there meant being surrounded by nature on a daily basis. I mean, I'd see things weekly that wildlife photographers would give their left nut to document. But I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd encounter the kind of thing I did on March 18th, 1999. It's something that I've thought about almost every single day since. Something I can't ever get out of my mind, and something I don't think I ever will. And it started off a chain of events that I gradually became obsessed with, and that has changed my life forever. I started with a call about a potential forest fire. My boss called and told me a hiker had seen some smoke rising up through the trees up near a place called Long Cabin in Sonora County. I probably don't need to tell you that forest fires can be absolutely devastating to an area like Yosemite and are taken very, very seriously by us park rangers. Now, y'all should know that Long Cabin isn't technically in our jurisdiction. It's actually closer to Stanislaus National Forest, but since there was no one up in that area to go check it out, my boss asked me to go check it out and call in the fire department if it was a serious threat. We get a good number of calls like this, and more often than not, it's just a family whose barbecue had gotten out of hand, or kids whose campfire is a little too big. So I agree to drive up there to check it out, as it was only a couple of hours drive there and back. So after about an hour's drive, I arrive at Long Barn, and I can see some black smoke rising up through the trees in the distance. This is unusual, as black smoke means it's not just burning wood, it's more like plastic or artificial fabrics, and it definitely just wasn't wood burning. This is kind of a relief at first. It meant it wasn't an outright forest fire, but it did mean someone was burning something that was definitely not good for the environment. I park up as close as I can to the source of smoke, then hike off through the trees, basically just following my nose as the smell of the burning plastics gets stronger and stronger. Then I see it. A burned out car abandoned among the trees, still kind of smoldering, but I guess the fire had been set at night and had mostly burned through before I got the call about it. My first thought was joy riders. Something as simple as car thieves that had bust into someone's vehicle, tore it up and down the quiet country roads up here, then just abandoned it and set it alight to cover up any evidence. Again, this is a pretty unusual crime out here in the sticks and you can forgive me for associating that sort of wanton mischief with more urban areas. But then I started to smell something else among the smoke. Something more like burning meat. I'm a huge barbecue guy myself, and I know what it smells like when you leave something on the grill for too long. Like that acrid, charred stench that I know is going to lead to disappointment because I've messed up on some expensive T-bone or whatever. Only... You're definitely not supposed to smell that coming off of a burning car, are you? And as you can imagine, I started to feel very, very uneasy about the whole thing. I circled the burned out vehicle, looking for signs of animal carcasses or, God forbid, human bodies that were in or around the vehicle, but saw nothing. I even checked under the car, but again, didn't see a thing. I pulled out my phone to get in touch with the Sonora County Sheriff who said he'd send over a couple of guys to check the scene out within the next hour or so, but who also asked me to stick around so I could guide them in and show them exactly where the vehicle was. 
so given the fact that I had an hour or two to kill waiting for them, I went into the trunk of my truck, pulled out the little fire extinguishers stored back there, and proceeded to put out the few small fires still burning in and around the vehicle. I do so pretty effectively, but when I'm done, I notice that there's still something smoldering in the trunk. Smoke keeps seeping out of the cracks, and the more it does, the more I can smell that burning meat smell. And that's when it really hit me. Something or someone was in that trunk, and that's where the smell was coming from. Waiting for those sheriff deputies seemed like it took an eternity, mainly because when they got there I knew they'd be able to open that trunk and I really didn't want to see what was inside. So they get there, I tell them what I suspect has happened and what I suspect is in that trunk. One of the guys uses a crowbar to wrench the trunk open, which was pretty easy considering the fire had warped the metal locks, keeping it closed. But what we saw inside is something I saw over and over again in my nightmares for many nights to come. It was a mess of blackened, burned flesh and contorted limbs. The sight of it alone caused me to gag and retch, puking up my breakfast onto the forest floor. Even those deputies, hardened by years of witnessing violence and cruelty on a daily basis, had a hard time dealing with what they were seeing. One just leaned against a tree, mouth covered with a cloth rag he kept on him, probably for this exact reason, while the other called into the coroner to deal with the dead bodies. They told me I could make a move back to Yosemite whenever I was ready, and boy was I ready. I got out of there as soon as I was able to. From what I understand, the sheriff's deputies soon discovered that the two scorched bodies in the trunk of that burned-out vehicle were those of Carol Sund and Selvina Peloso. The two women, along with Carol Sund's young daughter Julie, had been missing since the previous February, when they were last sighted alive and well at the Cedar Lodge near Yosemite National Park. It was actually one of my colleagues over at the park that had been the last person to see them alive, and the whole thing had drawn national attention, landing them on the cover of People magazine when some journalists took an interest in the story. And I mean, it was a really interesting story, albeit a very morbid one. Carol Soon's wallet had been found on a street in downtown Modesto, California, three days after they had disappeared, and Julie Soon's body was found dumped in a heavy underbrush by an overlook at the Don Pedro Reservoir, several miles from the logging trail where the car had been found. Her throat had been slit from ear to ear. Local sheriffs and the FBI initially focused their investigation on a group of meth heads up in Northern California who had previous convictions for stalking and assaulting lone groups of women. But all those leads were abandoned when a break in that case cast light on another suspect, because the story doesn't end here. In fact, it got even worse for all of us that worked up in Yosemite. One of the staff members at the Yosemite Institute was a young woman named Joy Ruth Armstrong. Joy was friendly, bubbly, and just generally a great person to be around. I'd only ever met her once or twice in my time as a park ranger, but I could see why she was a popular member of the team. She loved nature and she loved her job, even more passionately than most others on her staff. But in July of that same year, 1999, Joy had made plans to spend a weekend visiting friends down in Sausalito. Team members who lived in the log cabin she shared with them in Yosemite Village said their goodbyes, wished her safe travels, and watched as she wandered off among the trees to catch a ride down to Sausalito. But a few days later, when she was due to return to the village, she didn't show up. She'd actually left some contact details with the team just in case they needed to talk to her, but... When they followed up with a call to check up on her, her friends told them she hadn't actually arrived to spend the weekend with them and that they were starting to get worried. A group of rangers went over to the cabin she stayed at, only to find her white pickup truck was still parked in the driveway, packed with luggage for a trip. Having decided to begin their search in the immediate area, the rangers split up into smaller groups. They trudged through dense brush watching for rattlesnakes and looking for signs of their missing co-worker. Then after only a short while of searching, they apparently spotted footprints, broken saplings, trampled ferns and grass, all signs that someone had recently ran or perhaps even been chased. That's when one of the rangers noticed something metallic, glinting in the sunlight just a few feet away. 
It was a key ring lying in a shallow ditch. It was the sighting of this key ring that led them to spot something else. A dead body. It had on the white t-shirt and blue jeans that Joy had been wearing the day that she left for Sausalito. Except now, they were filthy, dirt encrusted and blood stained, but despite bearing such similarities to our missing co-workers, it was impossible to immediately identify the body. That was because whoever had killed this person had also taken the time to cut off the head, decapitating it completely. For those of us that worked in and around Yosemite, Joy's murder meant that the nightmare of those burned bodies, the nightmare we'd all tried to forget about, had come back with a vengeance. The killings were made even more disturbing to us by just how rare it was for anything like that to happen in this area of California. According to one of the older rangers, the last known murder to occur inside of Yosemite's boundaries happened 12 years earlier in 1987, when a guy pushed his wife off of a cliff in order to collect on a life insurance policy. As you can tell, I've thought about this whole thing and researched the various murders a whole lot, and I've discovered that the chances of being murdered in one of our national parks is about 1 in 20 million. Basically, you have more chance of drowning in your own bathtub, so please don't think that this is an actual thing. People don't just hang around in the woods waiting to ambush unwary hikers. In the months that had followed the discovery of those burned bodies in the trunk of the car, the cops had almost no luck in finding a suspect. And honestly, we didn't expect Joy's murder to be anything different. But unbelievably, in the immediate aftermath of her killing, local authorities got lucky, thanks to a witness statement given by one of our co-workers. They had noticed a blue and white 1979 International Scout parked near Joy's cabin on the night of her death, and the cops put out an APB on it right away. Then a few days later on, two park rangers spotted a vehicle that looked remarkably similar parked on the shoulder of a highway not too far away. What happened next was truly bizarre. I spoke to the guys who found the truck who said they searched around for it for a while until they came across a guy sunbathing, completely naked, at a nearby riverbank. They asked who he was, and he told them he was a handyman at the Cedar Lodge, some vacation homes built close by, and that his name was Carrie Stainer. The guy seemed kind of embarrassed that he'd been caught in the nude like that and quickly left the area, but my co-workers immediately called the encounter into local cops, who showed up and compared the tire tracks left by the trucks to those left at the scene of Joy's murder. They came back as exactly identical. A few days later, the same weird guy was taken into custody while he was visiting some nudist resort over in Sacramento. When they took him into custody and interviewed him regarding Joy's murder, he confessed, just straight up confessed, then also confessed to the fact that he'd murdered Carol Sund, Salvina Peloso, as well as Carol's daughter, Julie. The FBI were called in for additional questioning, and it was then that Carrie Stainer told them all about how he had fantasized about hurting women ever since he was a child, and how he had been completely unable to silence the voices in his head that told him to kill. For five whole months, this absolute psychopath had been living right under our noses, hiding in plain sight. He'd been chilling up at Cedar Lodge, doing his job, and eyeing up potential victims under the pretense of being a friendly, albeit a little kooky, local handyman. From what I can gather, no one had suspected him of having anything to do with the disappearances of Soon de Peloso because he also just seemed way too nice, too much of a regular dude. That and the Stainer family name had been in the news before, for a reason that led investigators to believe that there was no way that Carey had it in him to do something so terrible. You see, many years before, when Carey was just 11 years old, his younger brother, 7-year-old Stephen, disappeared without a trace one afternoon while walking home from school on his own. This devastated the family, causing a huge rift between Carey and his dad. Eventually, Stephen escaped captivity after seven long years as the slave of Kenneth Parnell, a convicted child abuser and former employee of the Yosemite Lodge inside the National Park. He became a celebrity of sorts. There was national newspaper and television coverage, as well as a book and a TV miniseries chronicling his years of abuse. Whether or not that whole thing shaped Carrie into the violent psychopath he eventually became is 
something I don't think anyone will be able to properly determine. But shortly after, Carrie began to claim he'd seen Bigfoot. Yes, the ape-man thing that's said to inhabit the woods of the Pacific Northwest. He was well on his way to being completely detached from reality. At his trial in 2002, Carrie Stainer pled not guilty by reason of insanity. His lawyers asserted that the entire Stainer family had a history of abuse and mental illness, manifesting itself not only in the murders but also his obsessive compulsive disorder, his obsession with cryptids, specifically Bigfoot, and his request to be provided with obscene images in return for his eventual confession. He was nevertheless found sane and convicted of four counts of first-degree murder by a jury on August 27, 2002. The court then had to decide if he would be executed for his crimes, which it unanimously decided that he should, and rightfully so. Stainer remains on death row as of September 2019, but problems with California death penalty laws are frustrating the process and it's becoming increasingly unlikely that Kerry will suffer the same fate as his many victims. I know this was an overly long post, but as I'm sure you can all understand, this is something I've been quite frankly obsessed about since the discovery of those burned bodies affecting me most personally. I'm actually considering writing a book about the whole thing and my experiences living and working in the places that most of these crimes occurred. If I can't ever get these things out of my head, why not try to turn the whole thing into a kind of therapy, turn it into something that others can enjoy and maybe something I can make a few bucks out of, even if that does make me feel like a freaking vampire profiting off of other people's misery. Maybe let me know in the comments section, but regardless, I hope you enjoyed reading this and maybe... Just maybe, it'll help keep you safe in a world where people are out there with the worst compulsions imaginable, driving them to kill. I've worked for the United States Forest Service here in Texas for just shy of 10 years now. I love my job, and it's rare for anything particularly creepy or scary to happen, but Having worked this job for so long, I have my fair share of stories I can share that might just make the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end. For example, we sometimes get jaguars hunting in the forest here, a particularly scary big cat and that's because what they do with their prey once they're caught and subdued. So just picture the scene. You're walking through the trees on some bright sunny day when all of a sudden you start to smell something rotten. You look around but there's nothing to be seen, just the picturesque view of the pines and the sound of birdsong floating through the green. Then something hits the top of your head, something wet. You place a hand on the top of your head, feeling something cold and slimy dribbling through your hair. You bring your hand down to see what it is. It's not bird poop. It's something way worse. It's blood. You look up and hanging up in a tree just feet above your head is a mutilated, half-eaten corpse of an animal. Guts torn out, skin shredded, face half-eaten with hooves or paws missing, with broken pieces of bone protruding from cracked limbs. It seems an utterly bizarre thing to do, but the jaguar has a good reason for doing all this heavy lifting. If a jaguar doesn't bother to hoist its kill into the tree, it risks losing its meal to other more ground-based predators or scavengers. Creepy, yeah, but... That kind of natural world stuff is nothing compared to some of the other stuff that I've encountered during my time in the Forest Service. So this other time I'm on a routine walk through some of the trails to make sure all the directional signs and information markers for tourists are all in order. There's a large rock protrusion about a hundred meters off of this trail like this big sandstone boulder that juts out of the earth that has kind of like a shallow cave carved out on one side that's been worn away from thousands of years of wind erosion. As I get close, I see a guy in what I first thought was camouflage hunting gear hanging around the entrance. I call out to him, just some friendly greeting, nothing threatening, and he turns to look at me. Only he doesn't say a word. He just runs off through the trees. I start getting worried about what he was doing in the cave, terrified that he's left a body or something there, and honestly... I thank God that he hadn't, but it seems like he did leave something behind. 
I mean, I'm not even 100% sure it was him that did this, and I've often considered the possibility that it was him that happened across this little find first, and seeing me got the idea in his head that it was me that left those things there. He got the idea into his head, saw me, and just freaked. But when I walked into that little cave and shone my flashlight around, I saw something that would completely explain why he was so quick to run away, whatever his motivations for doing so were. Teeth. There was a little circular patch of dirt, one that looked like it had been raked over to clear some space, and in the middle of it all were a bunch of human teeth. I don't know why they were there, I don't know who left them or why, but I did what I could. I gathered them up in a little plastic bag that I had on me that had previously contained my lunch and took them down to the nearest police station, giving a little description of the guy that I'd seen run away from the cave. I have the usual wild animal encounters, weird noises during the night, but I've never forgotten those teeth. I have no explanation to offer up at all, but it certainly does make for a good little campfire story. Montana has to be one of the most beautiful places in the world, and it's one of the last beautiful places in the United States that still feels truly wild, unlike my native California where almost every area of natural beauty is plastered with man-made trails, ranger stations, and tourist traps. But I don't mean to offend anyone. I'm sure your favorite hiking spots in Wisconsin or Washington or wherever are amazing, and maybe it is just a little internal bias talking having watched too many old cowboy movies with my dad. But to me, Montana truly feels like one of the last untouched wilderness areas in North America. And luckily, a buddy of mine feels exactly the same way about it. So every year around September, he and I would take a trip up to Bozeman to spend some time away from the big city life out here in Frisco. We've been friends forever and pretty much spent all high school and college days together. But since we slammed into our 30s and did all the boring grown-up stuff like get married, have kids, focus on careers, we don't have nearly enough time to spend together. So I honestly relish our year trips out to Montana together, where we can catch up on stuff, get some serious drinking in, but most importantly, indulge in a mutual hobby of ours that's verged on an obsession ever since we were teenagers. Hunting. Our stomping ground of choice has always been Glacier National Park right up on the Canadian border. It's about a five-hour drive from Bozeman itself, but we make a point of driving out for a few days, one to get settled into a campsite, another few to actually hunt, all before a few days of drinking back in Bozeman to celebrate our successes or commiserate our failures. Last night, we repeated the same old ritual, driving out to the National Park with our hunting gear in tow. We found a good place to park the truck, hiked a few hours out into the wilderness and found a decent little spot to set up camp. Every year we seem to be a little more exhausted when the days end. Call it just a side effect of getting older, I guess. So last year in particular, we passed out pretty early in our one-man tents with the intentions of rising at dawn to begin our day's hunt. 6 a.m. the next morning, the little alarm on my wristwatch starts beeping. It's the closest thing we have to that feeling of Christmas morning when you're a kid. It's just pure excitement. Jumping out of bed to see what hunting Santa has left among the trees for us that day. We have a little breakfast, drink a little coffee, then pack up and head out. For those of you that are unfamiliar with hunting or nature in general, there are two times in a day when birds sing the loudest, dawn and dusk. It sounds all pretty to us humans, like this wonderful lyrical bird song, but it's actually just pure war cries. What sounds sweet and cute to us is actually like, I'm here and if you come up in my tree I'm gonna mess you up, so back the F off, off brothers, for real. And it's something that soundtracks every morning hunt, every single time we visited Glacier. But that morning it was almost silent. We could hear the odd squawk in the distance, but our immediate vicinity was as silent as the grave, and that only means one thing, that a large predator is in the area, something that's on the hunt. I remember the look on my buddy's face when he turned to me and stated that exact thing, how I double-checked that I had my can of 
bear mace on me just in case anything happened. But that area of Montana right near the Canadian border is known to have wolf packs roaming around, and I shuddered at the thought of what would have happened if we were cornered by one. Two aging city boys would be run down in an instant. We wouldn't stand a chance. We'd be torn apart and eaten alive right there on the forest floor, probably before we could even get a shot off. Trigger discipline is probably the most important aspect of firearm safety, but I struggled to keep my finger off the trigger of my Remington once I'd racked around into the chamber. The fear was palpable. It felt like something was close, real close, and in woods as dense as the ones we were in, something could be on top of us in just seconds. Then, just another mile or so walking through the near-silent forest, we saw it in the distance, a grizzly and it was huge. I'd never seen one in the flesh before that day, and I was completely overwhelmed by the size of that thing. I mean, they are monsters, in the very sense of the word. Just a flesh tank, a ball of muscle and sinew, perfectly designed to chase down, kill, and shred whatever they take a liking to. We watched it staring back at us, this, like, dull expression on its face before it sniffed the air a little, catching our scent. We must have looked like frightened little boys, but to the grizzly, we were nothing. This was just another day and we were just another meal, another kill, business as usual. We just slowly walked on, keeping our eyes on that murder machine the whole time until it was eventually out of sight. We're not dumb. We knew we couldn't just hang around and carry on our hunt with that thing in the area, especially not since it had our scent. So slowly but surely we made our way back to camp with the intention of packing up and moving to a safer area. But God laughs at well-laid plans. And about halfway back, as we were keeping our heads on a swivel, trying to keep an eye out for that thing stalking us through the trees, I heard something heavy, bounding towards us. I couldn't see it right away and frankly, the idea that something so huge could just creep up on us like that is something that is just pure nightmare fuel to me. But stalk us it did, and in a moment of pure stomach-churning horror, it knocked my buddy to the ground as easy as a grown man might knock over a child. I mean, it just sent him crashing into the dirt, and it was on him in seconds. How I managed to miss that thing's head with my first shot is something I'll never really understand. I'm an experienced hunter, and I'm a pretty good marksman, but pure panic took over and crippling fear just had me turning to jelly. The feeling of expecting to see my best friend in the world torn apart before me is something I'm never ever going to forget. I'm not military, I've never had any official training, nothing like that, so I didn't even think to work the bold action and chamber another round. I just went for the bear mace and sprang it right in that thing's eyes as it slashed its claws across my buddy's chest and face, tearing up clothing and flesh alike with deep, gouging strikes. His screams, though. That's what I kept hearing in the quieter moments during the months following that trip. These blood-curdling screams as he thought he was going to die. And not just die. Be eaten alive. Watch his own guts be torn from his body and chewed up right there in front of him. But it worked somehow. The bear maze just worked. It immediately stopped clawing at my buddy. It started like wrinkling its nose and doing these weird like sneezes or coughs. I can't really think of any way to describe it. But what was obvious is that it was in considerable discomfort as the ingredients in the mace went to work on its nose and eyes. Then, as suddenly it has appeared, it took off again, crashing through the trees, smacking into the odd one or two as it obviously struggled to see where it was going. Then it was just a case of checking on my buddy, but Jesus Christ, he was an absolute mess. The bear's claws had torn off chunks of flesh from his face, shoulders, and chest, and blood was everywhere, and I mean everywhere. I was frantic too. I kept alternating between trying to tend to his wounds and looking around to make sure the bear wasn't charging us again. Like when I think back to it, I can only see certain frames... It's not like a movie in my head, it's like still pictures. Side effect of the adrenaline, I guess. The blood is leaking off of my buddy as I help him to his feet. He was capable of running, but the attack had stunned him and 
He shook violently as I pulled him up and started dragging him back in the direction of our campsite. I knew the bear mace or bear spray or whatever you want to call it had worked. But for how long I had no idea. And so we ran, as fast as our legs could carry us, through trees and over hillocks. Until we saw the bright orange fabric of our one-man tents. Another weird memory I have is of my buddy applying his own gauze bandages like... Like he'd think the guy would be in major pain at that point, but he was just running on pure adrenaline. That bear had torn him up real bad, but he couldn't feel a thing. It was just pure survival instinct kicking in. He was a survivor, and he wasn't about to go down easy, and in a twisted kind of way, I was really proud of him. By that point, my one major concern was that he would lose too much blood on the way back to our truck. I mean, he'd already left a blood trail from the scene of the attack, so the bear would be able to trace our path really, really easily. So I was stuck in a horrendous catch-22 situation. Leave him with his rifle and risk getting attacked again, or have him come with me to get help and risk bleeding to death or leading the bear onto our trail. But a primal, angry roar that echoed through the trees kind of made the decision for us. The bear was still in the area. Not even that. It was close, and it was angry. I wrapped like half my buddy's head in gauze, taped a load of it to his chest, and we got running again. Almost every step we took, I expected that bear to just appear again. Only this time, if it attacked me, my buddy wouldn't have a rifle to be able to take this thing out. Although the fact that that bear mace had worked was actually a huge comfort, so there was no doubt that it would work a second time. But we got lucky for a second time that day. First time when the injuries to my buddy weren't as bad as they could have been, and second when that bear didn't rally for a second attack. We made it out of the park and down to a place called Ennis pretty quickly. Visited a medical clinic, got my buddy all stitched up and patched up, then actually headed to a bar to just decompress and unwind from the nightmare we just lived through. Needless to say, my buddy didn't have to buy a single beer that night. Not as he told the story of getting full-on attacked by a full-grown grizzly. We're not sure if we're going to go on our trip this summer with Locktown and stuff aside. I'm not sure either of us are quite ready to get back on that horse. But I look forward to the day when we are. I'm not going to let a horrific encounter like that ruin the one thing that kept us close for so many years. Growing up, I was always on the heavy side. I suppose it's because I come from a family of food lovers whose portion control was never their strongest suit. It was all TV dinners and sedentary hobbies, so it's no wonder we were all of a certain size and shape. But it always bothered me. I'd see the attention skinnier girls got around school, and I know it doesn't align with my mostly feminist view of the world, but I wanted that to be me too. So a few years back, I started my own personal weight loss journey. Not so much so I could fit society's view of what beautiful is, but so that I could have confidence in myself and in my own body. I wanted to look good for me, and if that helped me land a hot guy, then cool. This is how I ended up taking up hiking as a hobby and why I spend so much time around Acadia National Park up here in Maine. The views up there also allowed me to indulge another hobby of mine photography. And sure, my pictures don't make it any further than my Instagram account, but still, it's something that brings me a lot of joy. Sometimes I'd drive up there with friends, but they couldn't commit to those long trips all the time, so there were times when I'd have to go up to Acadia alone in order to get my few hours exercise in. So I'm hiking the trails up there, taking pictures of the way the sun glinted off the ocean through the trees, messing around with filters, the usual photography stuff. I thought I managed to get this one amazing shot, something that was bound to get a whole bunch of attention on Instagram when I hear a voice sounding from behind me. Lovely day for it, huh? It was a man's voice. Friendly sounding, but still the shock of hearing it so suddenly made me jump. I turned, seeing a man in a park ranger's uniform. The hat, the little shorts, the whole getup walking up the trail behind me with one of those trekking poles in his hand. Oh, yeah, 
Got to make the most of the nice weather here in Maine. It's super rare. I try to sound as cheerful as possible, but I won't lie. I didn't really want the attention. At least, not from an older guy like that who'd also managed to ruin the composition of the photograph I was in the process of taking. I know that makes me sound unfriendly or whatever, but it, honestly, sometimes us girls just prefer to be left alone. But he continued to make conversation in that super annoying way that some people do. It's like they can't detect that you just want to have some time to yourself and opt for being gregarious. So I remained polite for as long as I could, nodding along as he talked about how lonely it could get being a park ranger up here, then eventually just straight up asked him politely to leave me to my photography, making something up about being a professional photographer who was surveying the area for a magazine I worked for. I know. I shouldn't have lied, but I got the distinct impression he wasn't going to leave me alone otherwise. But he took it on the chin. I suppose he got the craving for human contact out of his system. He told me he was so sorry to interrupt, wished me luck with my work, then carried on down the trail. So I take my photos, taking my time over them, but decided to turn back and walk the opposite way so I don't run into him again. I didn't think he was creepy or anything, I just didn't want to have that awkward moment of running into that guy again and being like, oh, hi again. Call me neurotic for wanting to avoid that, but that's just the way I felt about it. So I'm heading back the opposite way, taking pictures along the way, capturing the way the trails snake through the trees in such beautiful ways sometimes, looking like something out of a fairy tale. I happen to take a particularly aesthetically pleasing one, and I'm admiring it on my phone when I happen to notice some small detail in the center right of the frame. It was a figure, clearly wearing a pair of shorts, peeking out from among the trees. I know that's a pretty innocuous little detail. I know it was just the ranger I'd seen like an hour previous, but it sent a chill through me. Just how had he managed to loop around and get ahead of me even though he walked off in the opposite direction that I had. I felt distinctly unsafe, a flash of fear running through me as I began to suspect that this ranger's guy's intentions were far from good. I mean, who just follows someone like that? Or rather, it wasn't even following me that he was doing. This guy was straight up stalking me. But I had no choice but to walk by him. He had literally put himself between me and my car, so I had just to suck it up and walk past him, even if it was putting on a brave face to do so. I tried to, like, cut him off, if that made sense. I was prepping myself to just be like, Hi there, can't stop, late back for a meeting, or something to that effect. But it was him that spoke first. You know, it's just not safe for a girl like you to be walking around the park alone. I can't remember exactly what he said. That's just my estimation of it. You're really pretty. And bad things can happen to a pretty girl that walks around on her lonesome. I was ruined. I tried to think of something witty to say. Some cutting retort that would shame him for being way, way too familiar. But I couldn't. I was just terrified. Who says that to a total stranger? So I just carried on walking at an increased speed, ready to call 911 if he started to follow me. But he didn't. He just shouted like, Where are you going? Don't you want some company? Take care of being rude like that, little lady. You might just end up being rude to the wrong person. I thought stuff like that only happened in horror movies or something. That creeps like that couldn't really be walking among us, or that if they were... I suppose I just hoped that I'd never encountered one. So I get to the end of the trail, back to the parking lot where I'd left my car, when I see another ranger milling around the area, taking like little markers out of his truck or whatever. I walk up to him and demand to know who the other ranger on duty was, describing the way the guy looked, how his uniform was all dirty and stuff, how he carried that trekking pole, when suddenly I just started to feel sick. This other ranger... His uniform looked almost nothing like the guy back in the woods. It was clean, pressed, and starched. A lighter khaki color with different styles of patches on it. Some kind of main park service kind of thing, just different looking. I knew what he was going to say before he even said it. There was no other park ranger on duty at the time. 
He was the only guy in the area. No one else should have been wearing a park ranger's uniform. He saw the look of horror on my face. That nauseous, shell-shocked look as I realized just how much danger I'd been in walking around with that guy on the loose. I told him everything, but I didn't stick around to see what came of it. I just got in my car and went down back north towards Ellsworth, and it took me a long, long time before I was able to go back to Acadia, even with friends, and I make a point of never, ever going to secluded places like that alone. It's just not worth the risk of running into someone like that, someone willing to dress up in order to trick young women into feeling safe, when in reality, they may well have very, very different intentions. So this is a true story about one of the more real-life threatening moments I've experienced. About a year ago, I drove across the country to California for grad school. Total, the trip was about 2,800 miles, taking me across the middle of the country. I had two other options, to drive the northern route through Colorado or the southern way through Alabama and South Texas. Although this was probably the most boring way, it was the fastest by about six hours, and the entire trip took about four and a half days. I had recently been through a tough breakup and things back home all around weren't going great for me since undergrad, so that played into my decision to move to California. I really enjoyed the drive itself. It gave me plenty of time to reflect on my life and figure out the stuff I needed to change about myself. I would basically drive 10 to 15 hours a day until I got tired and book an Airbnb. I took my time on the drive. If I saw a cool national park or landmark to explore, I did it because it was the most free I've ever felt. I was driving through the Ozark Mountains to Arkansas. I'd never watched the show, but figured it would be a cool place to explore. I was making good time on the drive, so I took a 30-minute detour and followed the GPS on my phone to the center of the national park. I drove through a quaint town, past a junkyard filled with old rusted vehicles, and down a stretch of road that was covered in tall spruce trees. Eventually I lost service, but that was fine because I figured it was still a relatively frequented spot for outdoor junkies. I reached a gravel turnout marked with a wooden sign where people could take small boats to launch. I parked, locked my car, and grabbed my knife, some water, and hammock, hoping to find a cool spot by the river to get a peaceful rest. I found two trees with the perfect distance and set up my hammock, drifting off into a light sleep for about 30 minutes. When I decided it was time to go, I rolled my hammock into its case and put my large knife and water into the drawstring bag I carry them in. I should add that I carry the knife whenever I go hiking because I'm a paranoid person that's seen too many movies. I grew up hunting and fishing and wrestled in college, so normally I feel fairly safe by my own. As I walked up from the riverbank, I noticed a black SUV had parked and a young couple was standing behind it with the back hatch open. The guy was setting up a fishing pole and the girl was standing there just watching. I noticed a medium-sized black dog with medium-length hair. It looked like a lab mixed with maybe a German shepherd. My family has always had large dogs and this one looked friendly so the thought didn't cross my mind that maybe it wasn't. As I got closer to their car, which was parked by mine, the dog noticed me and started trotting towards me. As it got within five feet, I stuck my palm out for it to sniff. I don't know if it felt like I was a threat to the couple or what, but it instantly started barking and growling, running from its owner and back to me. As it did this, the girl just looked at it saying nothing, and the guy just kept messing with the fishing line. After a few times of running back and forth, the dog charged at me and I started backpedaling and yelling at it. This seemed to scare it off a little, but it kept charging and lunging at me, biting me through shorts on my mid-thigh, breaking the skin. Thankfully, it didn't hold on or shake, but I could immediately see blood running down my leg. I had no idea what to do, and I felt terrified and also intense anger towards the couple for not calling the dog off. The guy was still playing with his fishing pole while the girl looked on with an expressionless face. After the dog bit me, it continued to do its charging back and forth. As it ran back to them, I quickly opened my drawstring and fumbled with my knife. It was a large 10-inch blade in a black sheath. 
I drew it and yelled out to the couple that I would use it if I had to. Out of all the things I could have yelled to make myself seem tough, I just said, Please get your dog! I guess it was all my mind could process at the time. Finally, the guy looked up and called his dog back and held it by the collar, allowing me to get in my car. I did so as quickly as possible, no one saying a word to each other. As I drove off, the adrenaline wore off and what replaced it was pure anger. My brain was telling me that I should go back and confront the couple for being so careless about their dog viciously attacking another person. However, the logical side told me to keep driving and not look back. I know this might not seem like that big of a deal and could have been a lot worse, but imagine being a thousand miles away from home in the remote Arkansas wilderness with no phone service. I assessed the damage once I found a safe place to pull off the road and after I regained service. Luckily, the puncture wounds weren't very deep and I had a medical kit in my trunk from when I was a lifeguard. I dressed it with rubbing alcohol and cotton gauze and drove off. Looking back, I should have called the police or animal control because the dog could have had rabies. I really didn't even think about it at the time. I guess I was just still too shaken up. If I ever drive through Arkansas again, I'll make sure to never, ever go hiking again. I won't tell you who I am, I can't tell you where this happened, and I can't tell you when this happened. I got death threats for months after this, and I had to quit. I had to move. I had to change my entire identity to stop people from finding me. Some of you sickos will no doubt put in the time and research into working out all the details yourself, but just let me make it clear that my details were expunged from the employment records and you'll never, ever find me. And so, I can make my confession in peace. I used to work as a park ranger at a well-known, frequently visited national park. At this particular national park, there was an old ghost story that the veteran rangers used to tell about one of our number who heard a noise coming from a lake one day. The noise had apparently sounded like a puppy, yelping and splashing, but the ranger who heard it couldn't swim and wasn't about to put himself in danger of drowning just to save a dog. The next day, the body of a young child washed up on the shore. It was never a dog out there. It was a child that had fallen in the lake after being out there exploring unsupervised. The ranger was devastated. His spirit crushed that his selfishness had resulted in the death of an innocent child. He was haunted by the thought, took to drinking, wore himself down, until one night, while sleeping in his cabin, he heard a familiar noise coming from the lake. It was the sound of a little boy crying out to be rescued. He ran to the lakeside, dived into the water, and struggled his way into the center of the body of water until he reached the site of the splashing. But there he only saw the smiling, bloated corpse of that same little boy, who dragged him beneath the lake and drowned him, just as he had. That's the way the story went, and to be honest, I thought it was the biggest load of bull I'd ever heard in my life. I told the crusty old-timers that same thing, that I'd have to be of diminished capacity to believe a crock of nonsense like that, but instead of laughing or whatever, like, okay, maybe this guy isn't as dumb as we first thought, they got pretty angry about it. They told me not to disrespect the angry spirits of the departed, but then it was my turn to laugh. I could tell the difference between them getting annoyed over me disrespecting the dead or whatever and them getting annoyed over me just disrespecting their dumb stories. The following week, I found I'd had my shift pattern switched to nights. I confronted them about it, told them I was not impressed that they were that immature as to switch my shifts up, but they insisted that it was only cover for a guy whose mom had taken ill and been forced to drive back to his home state in order to care for her. I didn't believe a word at first, and I was just straight up angry at that point, angry that a pair of grown men would lie about something like that, basically just gaslighting me. But I didn't want to show them how frustrated I was. I just take it on the chin, so to speak, and not give them the satisfaction. So the first night I'm there in the lakeside cabin, I'm settling in to prepare for a long night of utter boredom, brewing coffee and playing dumb mobile games when I hear something from outside the cabin. I put down my phone, get up and walk over to the door to open it so I can listen out for what it is. I recognize it instantly. 
it's the sound of splashing, coupled with the sound of a child crying out for help between spluttered breaths. Ha <laughs> ha, very funny. I remember shouting out into the darkness. You think you can scare me with your dumb stories? Well, I didn't believe them then, and I don't believe them now. Try it with someone with an IQ as low as yours. This was obviously their little game playing out. Their attempt to scare me into submission and believing their backward ghost story. But I wasn't about to let that happen. I went back inside, slamming the door shut and jamming my AirPods in on full volume to block the noise out. They were selfish and vindictive. That's what I told myself anyway. But apparently not determined enough to keep playing that sound from whatever speaker system they'd set up around the cabin because when I paused my music like 20 minutes later, the noise was gone and all was quiet again. The next morning, just after sunrise, I pack up my stuff and prepare to leave the cabin. I was so exhausted and irritated by the prank they pulled. I wasn't prepared to wait for them to arrive. I figured if I did, I'd be so angry at seeing them that I might have knocked some of their freaking teeth out. That would get me fired, and I simply couldn't afford that, not with the economy and the estate that it was. But as I'm walking to my truck, something catches my eye from the lakeside. Something small and sodden that the gentle waves of the lake lapped against. I turned to look and saw what it was. And when I did, I dropped my bag in pure horror and disbelief at what I was staring at. It was the body of a child face down in the dirt. I pulled out my phone, dialed 911, and basically screamed at the operator for an ambulance to get out to that place I was based at. They had to send a helicopter in the end, but... Before it showed up, the two crusty old rangers rolled up in their truck, and their eyeballs almost fell out of their head when they saw me trying to perform CPR on the dead kid. I tried, and tried, and tried, but he was gone, long gone, and it was all my fault. I ended up word vomiting about what had happened the night before, telling them everything, how I thought the whole thing was part of a prank, part of the punishment for not believing their freaking story. They claimed to have no idea what I was talking about, which angered me even more. But when they asked me why I didn't help the kid, I flipped. I rushed one of the older guys, tackled him, and beat the life out of him before I was dragged off and talked me back down to earth. But I couldn't ever really calm down, not until the chopper arrived and put that kid's body on a stretcher. The paramedics seemed furious that there was no one to save. I remember one of them explicitly shouting over the din of the rotor blades that kid's been dead for hours. When they took off and I drove back home to go on indefinite paid leave, I thought that might have been the end of it, and that I'd have time and space to get over what had happened. But I didn't have time. Someone leaked the information out on what had happened. I don't know if it was the old timer I decked, the other ranger, or the paramedics, but somehow... Someone got a hold of my contact details and the threatening calls began. I'll never forget the night my girlfriend answered the phone in our apartment, saying hello in that happy, chirpy way she always used to. I watched as her face went from all smiley to neutral to downright horrified. Who is this? Hey, who is this? Call here again and I'm calling the cops. It was the first time of many death threats. The first of many... Many calls and handwritten letters and emails that told me I was an awful person. That I didn't deserve to live. That I was dead to the world the night I let that poor innocent young boy drown in that lake. When his lungs filled with water and the death spasms racked his body, he wasn't the only one to die. As I died too. Needless to say, she wasn't my girlfriend for much longer and I don't even blame her. There aren't many people who can handle that kind of abuse and I only got through it by myself, by the skin of my teeth. And so that led me to where I am today. I live alone in a state far, far away from the National Park where I allowed a child to drown. I legally changed my name, changed my entire look so no one from my old life would be able to recognize me. I went through an intense period of transformation. The old me is a ghost, as good as dead and dust in the wind. I thought that this would be therapeutic to write out. I just hope that no one will ever find me. 
no one. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, farts are just booty burps. <laughs>